What is up everyone, this is Kaysha Limited. Welcome to episode 32 of Spill the Tear on my JRPG podcast where I talk about JRPG news, releases, mechanics, what I've been playing, want to play, and more. And today we're going to be talking about the physical release of Honkai Star Rail, me finally fully completing Trails into Reverie and going into Trails through Daybreak, how I'd like an FF series that's long running, and more. And before we get into it, like I always say, if you are listening to this on an audio service, remember to give it five stars or thumbs up or whatever the app lets you do. It really helps my podcast get to disseminate it to more people. And um, if you have Twitter, slash x free feel to follow me i am at spill the tiro same name as the podcast so i'd appreciate that too in terms of today's episode it is going to be more what i'm playing heavy less than news heavy because i just wrote out the notes as i always do and there just honestly is not any jrpg news or jrpg releases really there's gonna be one thing that i'm gonna be talking about in terms of the, the news but like there are so, obviously there are like there's some news that's jrpg related but it's such like small or uninteresting news that it wasn't really worth bringing up and i do that every week and so i'll be talking about one thing and so i'm assuming this episode is going to be more on the what i've been playing and my experience of the game i've been playing side of things so just want to warn you about that if you do care about the news there will be some but not as much as usual and uh, the cool thing that i want to show today is i believe i mentioned this last episode maybe that there's like this anime store that i found here which is pretty cool and one of the things they do is they sell gotcha bags like real life gotcha bags based on series so they have like a final fantasy gotcha bag um a kingdom hearts gotcha bag which is never in stock full metal alchemist hunter hunter etc and uh, one of the ones is a ghibli one so i got that and uh they, they pretty much give you like a fuck ton of stuff so i thought i would show like one thing every episode and just get rid of all the stuff not get rid of them but like kind of go through all of them over like several weeks so one of the things that i got which i'll show right here is this which if you're an audio listener it's pretty much those button pin things i don't know what these are exactly called but they're all of the homie totoro and they're pretty cool i don't know what to actually do with this because I don't know what you actually do with these pins. Like, I guess people put them on their bag, but like, I'm not going to do that. And my bag is like leather. So that was like, fuck it up. And so I got to figure out what to do with this. Uh, I do have like an Ouroboros pin from Trolls of Cold Steel. It's a different type of pin where it's kind of smaller. I have it on the front of my PC case, which looks really dope. So maybe if this would fit, I might do that with one of these. I'm not sure, but yeah, I have no idea what I'm gonna do with these pins, but uh, they look cool. They have like Totoro on them and I love the home Totoro is cool shit. So yeah, I just wanted to show that. And uh, before we get into the episode, let's do the Spirit Away card like we usually do. Today's random card is a Six of Hearts. It shows kind of the weird ass looking people at the spa bath. One of them kind of looks like a frog and the other is the mustachioed fellow. I was thinking about this. I'm not sure. Should I keep doing this? I'm not sure. There's no fucking reason that I do this. I just started doing it because I got this deck of cards and I liked it. But like, in terms of like, Keep on uh, keeping on doing it. I, I realized what I should have done is that every time I show a card, I should have removed it from the deck. So every week would be unique. And then by the time the deck is done, that would mean a year has passed because there's 50 to 52 cards in this. And that'd be freaking cool that like yeah, exactly a year later, I'd be out of the deck. But I didn't do that. And so like, there's really no reason for me to be doing this. Maybe I'll go through my old episodes and see if there's been any duplicates. If there has been, oh well. If not, then like maybe I'll remove those and then just do this every time. And then once a year has passed cool we're done with the deck and i've also mentioned this before like uh, the year is kind of like the marker for this podcast where i want to get to and see whether i want to continue it or not after i get there the first marker was a three month marker where i want to make it three months to see how i felt there i made it past three months obviously it's been more than six months at this point and i thought it was doing fine and so i want to get to a year around episode 50 and then kind of assess whether i still want to do it because my life is going to be getting a lot busier in a few months and so at that point maybe i'll be like okay i'm proud of this podcast i think it's good and there's no need to continue it anymore so we'll see when we get there but that is a topic for the future so from here we will go on to the first segment which is jrpg news now for jrpg news this week as i mentioned in the intro there is not much there is one new story that i'm kind of interested in that i decided to bring up and again there's a lot of small new stories that like i just didn't think were that interesting or that important so i didn't bring them up but the one that i want to mention is that honkai star rail is getting a physical release on the playstation 5 and it's called the trailblazer edition i forgot to look up the release date so i'm going to be doing that right now okay so the release date is going to be on march 31st 2025 so a lot later than expected for some reason i thought it was soon i'm not sure why it would take that long but uh pretty much if you don't know what honkai star rail is it is a game from the creators of genshin impact but you may be wondering how there's a physical release because the game's actually free and so pretty much what this is is if you want the physical version you have it and you also get a lot of physical things with it so along with the physical release you get a holographic character card set you get a holographic chibi trailblazer keychain which is kind of like the main character they use you get a physical game disc obviously you get a playstation 5 postcard and you get some dlc the dlc thing is cool that's pretty interesting to know that you actually get some dlc with it and it is not a full game price it is 55 canadian dollars and uh, in america i'm assuming that'd be around 40 usd and so 
honestly this isn't bad like i personally won't get it because like i play honkai star rail here and there but like i'm not that deep into it and again it is free but if they drop this similar type of package for example for Wuthering waves which is a game that i really really love i probably would buy it for like 55 dollars and it's a game that i put a fuck ton of hours into just to show my support and get some physical stuff for the game yeah i would probably drop the 40 to 50 dollars for that and so yeah this is pretty cool if you're really into it i'm sure this is something i would be into if i played the game where i just haven't played that much because how they fucked up my save that i went over a lot of times but yeah but i just thought that was a very cool thing that they did and that is literally all for the jrpg news so we're just gonna go straight into the next segment which is jrpgs that are released this week as usual i source my release dates from rpgsite.net and icicledisaster.com this week not too many releases one of them is an expansion so the first one is on playstation 5 ps4 xbox series and pc on september 10th persona 3 reload episode agus is coming out that is i believe the final expansion for the game i've talked about this in previous episodes how they had i believe three parts and this is the third one i don't know anything about it really because i don't play the game and i don't want to go too deep into it because i'm, I'm assuming the spoiler heavy because this is kind of like a story-based dlc but yes the expansion pass is coming out on september 10th which was yesterday from when i'm recording and the second release date is for september 11th on mobile and pc which is today and that is dragon quest monsters the dark prince and i've talked about this previously on a previous episode which is that this is like a dragon quest game it focuses on these type of people that are called i believe monster wranglers a kind of you know wrangle monsters and the goal of the game is trying to become the most powerful monster wrangler in the world or something like that and i, I thought the concept was cool i like how the mc looks and they are even adding that class to i believe the dragon quest 3 hd remake which is pretty dope and so yeah this game is finally out i'm surprised again even though i was surprised the last time i brought this up but i, I am surprised that it is on mobile but as i said then i think it's fair especially at this point when you have games like genshin Wuthering waves etc on mobile more and more jrpgs really should be on mobile at this point because a lot of jrpgs aren't the type of games that are really pushing the limits of graphics so might as well put them on mobile to get a way bigger audience and like kind of normalize better quality games on mobile too and so yeah that's on september 11th which is today and that rounds out all the jrpgs that are releasing this week and from here we'll move on to the next segment which is a jrpg mechanic that i think is dope and for the jrpg mechanic that i think is dope this is kind of a boring answer honestly unless you're also into it like i am but also bring it up but um, i'm not gonna go too deep into it in this segment but i started trails through daybreak finally because i finally beat uh, trails into reverie and uh, one of the things that i do in trails as i mentioned all the time is that i love talking to every single npc wherever they are to get as much lore as i can about the world or what's happening in the world and so one of the things that trails does which is very interesting is when you talk to someone and they give information you can talk to them again and they sometimes give you more information and sometimes you can talk to them again and they give you even more information and the only way you know to stop talking is that you got to keep talking to them until you see something repeat and that's how it works and so trails has always been like this you just get a fuck ton of information from all the npcs and i've gotten so used to kind of the system of talking that every single game that i play that has npcs i always talk to them one time two times three times four times i keep talking to them until i get a repeat even though i feel like most people don't do that and this isn't any different with daybreak they have npcs that have like two to three to four lines of dialogue but what i've appreciated about this game specifically is they actually have an indication now that tells you when you're done talking to the npc which is a godsend i freaking love it so basically how it works is every npc that you can talk to has a blue bubble on top of them that says chat if you talk to them it'll stay blue if they have more to say and as long as you keep talking to them it'll be blue but once they're done saying anything new the speech bubble above them will turn gray and you're done and that's it that's what i kind of going to talk about but it's just such a nice quality of life thing where like it has gotten annoying where like in every game i play like i just keep talking to npcs over and over again because i'm just so used to it through muscle memory where it does get like kind of like headache worthy where i'm like i just keep seeing the same text where finally this game might kind of break the pattern for me where like i don't have to do that because i can see a visual indicator of the conversation being done not only that what i really love is that they made it so easy to see whether you're done talking to everyone in a location is because they also have an indicator on the mini map so the way they signify npcs that are interactable in this game is that they're a yellow dot on the mini map and if they're done talking they actually turned gray so you can literally just open up the mini map and add a glance to see whether you're done talking to everyone or not and that's a fucking amazing for me because i talk to every single person you know in a street or in the town or whatever and so the fact that at a glance i can see that i'm done talking to everyone is amazing for me i love it this is a mechanic that i fucking love i know it's so simple and stupid sounding but it's so simple where like they literally could have implemented this in any of the games like this is literally like a boolean operation like there's nothing complex about this but i love that they finally added it and one of the reasons why i love it even more is because i actually saw this feature in a game before i can't remember exactly which one it is i think it might have been one of the east games but i'm not 100 sure but 
I played the game and they had the exact same thing where there's a speed drop on top, it's colored, and when you talk to them, it'll turn gray. And I was like, holy shit, they actually added this feature. I loved it. And this was like a couple of years ago. And what I was very disappointed by and betrayed was I found out that whenever they indicated the NPC was done talking, it wasn't ever accurate. So pretty much what that game was doing is every time you talk to them once, it would indicate that you've talked to them and that's all it did. But sometimes if you talk to them again, they would have new information. So they were doing the, kind of the lazy approach where like, if you just talk to an NPC once, the speed bubble will turn gray and it would act as if you've, you're done talking with them. But if you talk to them again, you'd find out they actually have more to say. And so that game betrayed me. I have to keep talking to NPCs like I normally do to figure out all they have to say. But Trails Through Daybreak is actually a game where they actually indicate to me 100% of the time whether I'm actually fully done talking to an NPC. And not only will it tell me in the actual field of the game, but actually on the minimap too. So I've just really been loving that. And that's pretty much the mechanic I want to talk about. Just a very simple quality of life thing where it's a the this is like the, I want to say 11th Trails game I'm playing. And the fact that they finally added it is a very nice thing. And I hope to see more improvements like that because I'm only four hours into uh, Trolls Through Daybreak. I'll be talking about it more in a future segment. But yeah, that is all I have to say about a JRPG mechanic. I think is dope. And from here, we'll move on to the next segment, which is a JRPG that I would look forward to. I'm looking at the timestamp so far and we're only like 12 minutes into this podcast episode and we're like more than halfway done with the segment. So this is definitely going to be a shorter episode. But in terms of the JRPG that I am looking forward to or a JRPG that I would look forward to, because this is going to be one of those weeks where I bring up a hypothetical JRPG. And this isn't technically a single JRPG that I'm bringing up, but a JRPG that I would look forward to is a Final Fantasy game series. And that's it. So pretty much what I mean by that is, you know, Final Fantasy is famous for being a series where every game they bring out is supposed to be different. The combat style will be different. The visuals will be different. The world will be different. There's no actual timeline that connects the other games to each other. It's like more of an anthology series. And so what I would love is if Final Fantasy had a more of a long running series alongside the normal releases. They don't have to be huge games. It could be like smaller games, but like... I just like whenever like I like my favorite game series are Kingdom Hearts and the Trails games and I fucking love how dense they are with lore like they're teeming with lore and story and the worlds have so much potential and we're again I'm 11 games into Trails world and there's so much more to learn about that world and it's kind of disappointing honestly when I play a Final Fantasy game and I love the characters and more than them I love the world and knowing that like I'm never going to learn more about the world because after this game there's never going to be another game and I know they've done something like this in the past they've had Final Fantasy 10 1 and 10 2 I believe they've had Final Fantasy 13 1 and 13 2 I believe uh, both of which I haven't played I've technically played a bit of 10 1 but I, I wasn't really into it so I'm going to try it again at some point in the future but what I'm talking about is like, I want like a for example, like if say Final Fantasy 16 was one they picked, there's a Final Fantasy 16 1, then 2, then 3, then 4, then 5. Like it just keeps going. Obviously, assuming it was created with the intention of having a long running story, then do it. Don't just arbitrarily make more games. That'd be stupid. But if, for example, Final Fantasy 17, or it doesn't even have to be a numbered one, say it's called Final Fantasy Neo or some shit. I don't fucking know. But say, say let's just call the hypothetical game Final Fantasy Neo and say the creator has a plan for this game but their their plan for the story is like far reaching like they think they're gonna need like fucking 10 games to tell this shit like i would love that and obviously don't make it as big as a full mainline final fantasy game because those take years and years to make like the, the time between final fantasy 15 and 16 was way too fucking big and so if it's something that they can start working on and release a game every one to two years like smaller games like that'd be that'd be fucking awesome like i'd like that and yeah because like like i mentioned like final fantasy 7 for example is like a game with such an interesting world and it sucks that for the longest time we didn't have more games in the world and that's technically what we're getting now with the remake with the remake with rebirth and whatever the third ones that we called like even though technically it is a remake but they're expanding so much in the world and they're changing so many things where it does in a way feel like a sequel series kind of and so that's why I really want a long-running series of Final Fantasy. And what's funny is I was writing the notes for this segment and I was kind of writing like, oh, how I'd want a Final Fantasy long-running series. And then I thought about it. <laughs> we actually do have one. That's Final Fantasy 14. The more I thought about it, that's exactly pretty much what I want. It's a Final Fantasy game that's running alongside all the other Final Fantasy games. And every expansion you can just think of as its own game. They come pretty often. Like, they don't take too long. And they're obviously not as long as normal games do. So... It's funny, at the end of my notes, I realized again, like, yeah, Final Fantasy XIV is pretty much exactly what I'm asking for. Even though I prefer more of a traditional JRPG single player experience, I love Final Fantasy XIV, don't get me wrong, I, I enjoy it so much, but I just can't play that often because of it being a multiplayer game where, like, when I play games these days and I'm usually busy, 
I kind of want to be laid back on my couch, maybe, but it, I may play for four hours if I have time. I may play for 20 minutes. It, like, it all depends. And Final Fantasy XIV is a game, like, you can't really play for 20 minutes. Like, a lot of the times you're stuck in a storyline, or sometimes you have to play, like, a dungeon multiplayer, and so you kind of have to set aside a lot of time for it. And so while I love Final Fantasy XIV, I would love Final Fantasy to get a longer running series with its more traditional single-player JRPG approach, but... Yeah, it's pretty much all my thoughts on how, wanting a long-running Final Fantasy series, and hopefully that is a JRPG-type game that we can get in the future, and that's one that I would look forward to. And from here, we'll go on to the next segment, which is what I've been playing this week. Now, if you listened to my episode last week, you may be wondering why I'm talking about Trills into Reverie again, because last week I finished the game. But uh, pretty much what happened with Trills into Reverie, and I mentioned this last episode, is that once you finish the game, they actually have post-story content, which was kind of like an original experience for me. And so I pretty much spent this last week doing it, now, I'll be honest, when I was going to do the post-story content, I thought it would take a day. Like, I'm like, what else can they really have? It took me the entire week to do it. Like, I literally finished it, like, two days ago. And so, it was pretty hefty in terms of the post-story content. And honestly, it's kind of turned me around on me thinking that Trails of Reverie is a short game. It actually isn't a short game, especially with the post-story content. It pretty much felt as long as a normal Trails game, which is awesome. The only difference is they really didn't have the side quests that the normal trails games do. They didn't have the bonding that the normal trails do. So that was kind of disappointing. But in terms of like length, it did feel maybe a bit shorter, but it did feel pretty much equivalent to a normal trails game. And so pretty much what the post-story content is, I talked about this a bit last week, but after you're done the game, you're pretty much taken back into this space called the Reverie. The game is named after that. And uh, pretty much throughout the game, what the reverie is, you go into it every once in a while. And it's a space where once you enter, you you kind of forget what's happening in the real world. And once you leave, you forget to what happened in the reverie. And the entire point of the space is that all the main characters always come there every once in a while to pretty much train, get stronger. So that once they go back to the real world, they're more ready for whatever obstacles they have to go through. And so that's the point of the reverie. They don't know what this is. They don't know how they got there. They don't know who's in charge of the space, but that's just a space that they use. And so when the game finished, one of my biggest questions was like, what the fuck is a reverie? Like, what is this space that was there? And so that's what the post-story content was supposed to answer. And so you're back in the reverie, the characters are there, and they're pretty much trying to figure out like, okay, so what is this? place there's clearly more that we can go into there's a deeper space that we can go into the reverie let's figure it out and that's pretty much what the post story was and so in terms of like the length if, I, if you want to have an idea during the actual game you pretty much go i believe five floors or like four and a half to five and a half floors into the reverie in the post story game you go you i think you finish the fifth floor you go to the sixth floor i believe the seventh floor and then you go into like the zeroth floor. I believe that's what it was. And all the all the floors post uh, the story are longer than the previous one. So like you pretty much get like double the content. Honestly, it felt like that because the floors are a lot longer. Where the previous ones, after you explore like three areas of each floor or two areas, I think it was two areas you're done. And these ones are about three areas. And after they became like five areas, like they're they're a lot bigger. And so in terms of the gameplay, the gameplay is just like that simple. Like this was like one of those times where like I literally whenever I was doing gameplay, I just had a podcast on and just like played the game for hours, which was just dungeon crawling pretty much you're pretty much going through the floors you'd be fighting all the bad guys you'd have to fight a boss at the end of each floor and then at the end of each floor you get a bit of story and that's pretty much what happened and so gameplay wise it was very simple honestly i wouldn't even say if it was like great or anything it's just like you just cruise through it uh the bosses did get really fucking hard like near the end i pretty much had to do the thing where like i had to keep dying and retry and make the enemies a bit easier i had to do that a few times on like the final boss and so yeah, because I, di I didn't really want to go back and grind. I'm like, let me just do this. And I it did get easy enough. I was able to beat it. Thank God. And so the bosses are really hard. So if you're into, into like into hard bosses, that is the thing you can do. But in terms of like the actual gameplay, it wasn't that interesting. For me, it was mainly the story that I wanted to get, get into. And so I'm going to be going to the story now. Spoilers, obviously. If you don't want to be spoiled, I'd say just skip to the next segment because I'm going to be talking about this. And I'm also going to be talking about uh, Trails Through Daybreak a bit. So you could skip that too if you want, I guess, if you don't want spoilers. But uh, pretty much what the story is, is you're trying to figure out why the reverie exists. And slowly you go deeper and deeper to the reverie. You start seeing the silhouette of a girl. You find out that she looks just like a girl that's in your party. And then you realize that she's pretty much a being from like 500 years ago. Because the girl that's in your party is also from 500 years ago who pretty much um, was in a coma, you can say, who was asleep. And woke up in the present where this girl was from the past and she just got lost in time and she died or some shit at some point and so you meet her you she keeps telling you not to keep uh, go deeper into the into the reverie we don't listen we keep going deeper deeper to the reverie and then there's a there's a lot of lore lore drops honestly this is one of the first times in trails where like as they were dropping the lore i couldn't completely understand it like they're they're name dropping like 
who was in charge of the reverie and what was going on and who in history is doing it and how the reverie is because of this causality god that's looking over us and shit like that like a lot of like j you know jrpg stuff that happens but it's getting to the point like by the i was understanding all of it but like the last like five percent of it all the characters in the game were like oh i get it now and like i just didn't get it and so like i i'm honestly not completely clear on exactly who everyone was and who the final villain was i kind of get it i kind of understand but i'm gonna have to like probably do a reread or something maybe on a wiki just to completely understand it but you pretty much learn like the god that's behind it it's someone that you have heard of before you've seen in a flashback she ended up being the final boss she turns into this monster you gotta fight her and she was like, very happy that you killed her because she could now rest in peace and the reason you kind of want to do this too like the actual motivation of the characters is because the girl the silhouette that kept telling you to you know not enter she's pretty much like equivalent to the girl that's in your party like she's just a girl that like in another timeline she could have been in our on our side too like she could have had like a nice life but for some reason she has to stay here for eternity and so our characters kind of empathize with that and help her and at the end she's also happy and she pretty much goes back to her own time to fucking die i guess but that's pretty much the end of reverie and while that's cool and all that's not the aspect of the post story that i really cared about that was very cool i mean i did care about it but the more interesting part are the daydreams and i explained this last week but pretty much what the daydreams are in the reverie is they pretty much unlock a flashback episode of certain characters and you pretty much get to play through it sometimes the daydreams are just like cutscenes, and you watch through it those are the ones that i prefer the most sometimes they're cutscenes where you get to battle in between sometimes sometimes they're fully playable like you actually get to control the character and go through the daydream and some of them could be quite beefy like some of them are like 15 20 minutes some of them are like i felt like have been like an hour or something and so there were like three or four daydreams that i still had to do i did those and uh they're very cool like one was about ash and him becoming the student council president and like a lot of like um character moments with him i really fucking loved it uh others were like there was like a teacher at thor's like two teachers that like it was kind of hinted at how they liked each other so there was one daydream like completely about how they went on to get married and like the problems that came with that which is very cool and so i did all those daydreams that were cool when i actually finished the final boss i was like whoo that was a great game I loved it. I'm done with this game. I can move to Daybreak. It ended and it said, by the way, there's so plenty of stuff left to do. And I was like, how is there more to do? Because that's pretty much the exact same message that they wrote when you beat the original Final Boss. And so like, I was wondering what there was. And pretty much what they did is they gave me a white ceiling stone. And the ceiling stones are pretty much how you get the daydreams. You put them in a pedestal and it kind of opens like a gotcha thing. And usually like you get blue stones for daydreams. I think gold stones for characters, silver stones for like random items and red stones for mini games. And this time they gave me a white stone, which is new. That's something I hadn't gotten before. And so I, I went and I unlocked it and it gave me a new daydream. When you go into the daydream, it splits into three different daydreams. And it was very fucking cool. And pretty much all of them, what they were is they weren't even cutscenes. They were literally just text on a black screen and beautiful 2d like black and white images of what was going on and so there were three of them and pretty much i'm just gonna like tell you what they were for pretty much what they were for is leading you into trills through daybreak so pretty much it was stories that were happening in calvert and i am so glad i played these because i from what i played in daybreak i've already been able to connect to those stories because of daybreak and i'm only like three four hours into daybreak but already i'm like oh thank god i played that daydream i know who this character is they're like oh so the person that they mentioned in this daydream was the character in daybreak is very fucking cool and so pretty much just to quickly go over it uh, one of the daydreams this is the only daydream that hasn't connected to me yet in daybreak but pretty much is reen he's on vacation in calvert with his family he's pretty much there to look for his master he's there he gets jumped by ninjas he fights him off he's doing okay he's doing kind of good kind of fighting them off but at the end of it uh, a strong person comes i forgot who she is i think she was a president of something but it's some woman ninja and she pretty much cuts the sword in half tells him to fuck off and leaves and uh, that's pretty much all it is and i think she, i think she says something like reen you have to get stronger the next time you come here for like whatever is going to happen and so i think the point of the daydream was just so like in a future daybreak game maybe daybreak 2 reen is going to be there and like be a lot stronger and there's gonna be a reason for it because he got his ass beat from someone in calvert and he has a reason to get stronger so that's what i'm assuming the, the daydream is for because so far in the few hours i played of daybreak it hasn't connected so that was the first daydream. The second daydream was pretty much, it was a very like, it pretty much, it was telling a story about this female bracer and they never show how she looks. Like they showed like, as they're telling the story, like as they're telling the story, they're zooming out to different parts of her. So at some point they're zooming out to like her arm and then they're zooming into her leg. And it clearly is just one picture that they're just showing like crop versions of. And at some point they're showing like 
kind of her chin and like not her face fully and you just kind of hear the story of this bracer who's very new who's six months into it but she's really fucking talented and funnily enough zin is trying to get her promoted if you don't know who zin is he's this character from children of the sky who's from calvert so it's very cool to see that he is part of you know the story in daybreak potentially and so He's trying to get her promoted. She doesn't feel comfortable doing so. It kind of explains the job she goes on and how a lot of the people that she knocked out there end up being murdered by some other group and how she has to take this seriously. And uh, she pretty much gets more confidence in herself. And by the end of the story, she kind of accepts the promotion, becomes an A rank bracer, which is kind of like the top of the top. It's right under S rank, which is kind of fucking elite. But A rank is very good. And in it there's a lot of like hints of her saying like she has like this blue haired friend that she hasn't seen in years she's trying to figure out, out where he is she has this bespectacled friend that kind of like works in so she's a bracer she explains that the blue haired friend works in a job that's slightly illegal and her glasses friend is someone who works in a job which is very legal like that's kind of how she describes it and i'm like are these people that i know and i try to think of like blue haired people i'm like it's not kurt probably I couldn't like name like other blue people like I do know other blue characters but no one that would really fit and in terms of the the glasses person I'm like are they talking about Machias or something I'm like I don't know who they're talking about and I'm four hours into daybreak and I know who all those characters are now which is funny so I'll be talking about that more once I'm actually talking about daybreak but yeah that was a second daydream and the third daydream and probably my favorite was uh one uh, it was my favorite because it was pretty much describing what one character that we know and how they're doing in Calvert and that character is Ren Ren the fucking little kid from Trolls in the Sky she's been in like all like in a lot of the games with the series she is now in her last year of high school and so she's like 17 or 18 and she's going to an exchange program in Calvert and so she's there it kind of shows her time there it shows her kind of getting bullied and how the student is kind of taking advantage of his dad's political power and Ren, Ren fucks him up and his life up where like she pretty much publicizes how the dad is doing corrupt shit so he has to get kicked out of office and the kid ends up leaving school too which is really funny and throughout that they kind of introduce some characters so one of the characters introduced is like a blonde girl who j ends up joining the student council with Ren and I predicted that it would be this character in Daybreak because I, I have seen the, the cover of Daybreak so I know there was a blonde girl in the cover and uh spoilers that ended up being that character that i thought it was so that was the last daydream and that was very cool because that was the one daydream which kind of cemented that there would be a character that we know in calvert and they potentially would be in daybreak whereas the reed one i knew he wouldn't really be in daybreak like that was clearly a story to kind of motivate why he would be stronger the next time we see him and so i don't even know if he's going to be in daybreak one it might be more of a daybreak two thing and the other daydream of the bracer which was very cool it was pretty much characters that we didn't know about so like while that was dope this ren one was a lot cooler to me because we know ren so well now it's kind of seeing her go in this situation or or like try to figure out this school situation especially with how she used to be like a fucking murderer and now see how she navigates school and like fucks over this kid it was really funny and so i really loved it and that's gonna be where my thoughts end for trails into reverie and so i will kind of smoothly go into trails through daybreak now and trails to daybreak i'm loving i was very surprised of how how much of a jump it is from trails into reverie because uh, pretty much the jumps that happen in the Trolls games are the Trolls of the Sky and Zero Azure games are like these chibi type games. The Trolls of Cold Steel 1 and 2 are like these more 3D PSP games. And then 3 and 4 are like these more like polished, newer style, modern uh, Trolls games. And Reverie, for the most part, is pretty much the same style. It's kind of like this polished PS4 style game. And so I thought Daybreak would be the same. But that's definitely not the case. Uh, Daybreak, uh, the character animations are a lot more advanced now. Like, usually you could tell there were just canned animations that were going through. But in Daybreak, just like the intro, like, scene, like, characters were, like, moving around a lot more. There's a lot more custom animations and expressions they were using. The intro cutscene was a lot more cinematic. It was very fucking cool. Uh, again, the graphics are a lot better. And I was just surprised how everything is different. The combat is very different, where it is still turn-based but you have freedom of movement when it's your turn so you can move wherever you want and attack if you don't want to turn base you can do real-time combat where you can just fight the enemies on the field and you literally get to choose when to go turn base if you want to which is really fucking cool and in terms of connecting to reverie it fully connects to the daydreams that i was just talking about where uh the daydream of ren being in school and being with a blonde girl the blonde girl straight off the bat is into the story you learn that she is ren's friend because at the start of the of the story, she's reading a letter and is signed Kitty. And if you know, Kitty is pretty much the pseudonym of Ren. It's her hacker name. And uh, later, I won't go too deep into it, but later in the game, uh, four hours in, you do end up seeing Ren. And not directly, but you see the back of Ren as she's kind of doing some stuff, which is really fucking cool. So I really hope to see her more in the story. 
So that daydream already paid off in spades. Uh, the daydream where they show the bracer and the friends that already paid off. It's funny because I was playing the game and maybe like 30 minutes in, I was like, oh my God, the main character of this game is a blue haired friend that she was talking about. Like she said, like I have a blue haired friend. He has messy hair and he kind of works in this industry, which is kind of on the line of legality. And as the main character was talking to the blonde girl, he describes his job and he was like, yeah, my job is kind of on the line of legality. And I'm like, Oh fuck, it's him. So that was very cool to notice and kind of put two and two together. And then later on, they introduce her to the bracer and they also introduce the be spectacle friend, which ends up being in the CID, which is really fucking cool. And so that day dream paid off too. Again, and the Reno one didn't pay off yet because it is, I assume, just to motivate his um, kind of training arc, I guess that'll happen off screen. But I just, I'm just like so happy that I played the Daydreams because there is a world where if I wasn't that much into Trails, and I feel like a lot of people probably did this, where like they finish Trails, they learn that there's more to do in the Reverie, they just don't do it and they go into Daybreak. And you can do that, obviously, but the fact that I have so much of the context already is amazing. Even for the smallest things, like in one of the Daydreams, there was this reporter named Dingo, and they kind of you know, mention him and he's in the story too. And and like there's there's little callbacks where uh the main character Van is talking to Dingo and Van's like, Oh, by the way, I uh, can you do this for me? Because I did help you out kind of take care of that fucking kid before and that kid was the one that it was in the Ren Daydream that got fucked over. So at the time of the daydream you didn't know that, but Van is actually one of the people that actually helped fuck over the politician and the kid, which is very cool to see. And so little things like that, it was just very cool to see connect to the daydream. And I hope to see more connections like that as I play through the game more. I'm going to be playing this game very often. I'm going to be playing it tonight too because I'm just enjoying it so much. But yeah, I don't want to talk too much into the game because there there is a lot of details about the game that I want to talk about. But I think that probably makes sense to talk about next week as I play the game more because this was a very reverie heavy episode so i'll probably save more of the details of daybreak for next week where i go more in depth into the battles and what's happening in the story and things like that but yeah that was uh what i've been playing this last week and from here we'll move on to the final segment which is my jrpg top casual list now this is the final segment and this is a jrpg top casual list and if you don't know what that is it's pretty much a top list that i make very casually i don't think about it too hard i just kind of make the list off the top of my head and it can change every day who knows but that's the fun of it if you have your list let me know down in the comments below but the list for today is my top main character trails groups now if you don't know what i mean is in every trail series, the main character is a part of some kind of organization. And I was very interested to see what that was in Daybreak 2. And it was very cool to see that in Daybreak is literally just the main character's business. That's what it is. He just has his own business. But pretty much in every single series, the main character is a part of an organization. In Trails in the Sky, the main characters are part of the Bracer Guild. In uh, Trail Zero slash Azure, the main characters are part of the SSS, they're cops. And in Trails Cold Steel, the main characters are part of Thor's, the military academy. And so I thought I would just order those in the order that I think are the coolest or like the ones I like the best. And so my list is at number three is the Bracer Guild. And number two is the special support section, which is the SSS. And at number one is Thor's. Now, at number three being the Bracers. I don't hate any of these. I love all these. This is just the order that I came up to. But I think the reason I put Bracers at last is because while the Bracers are really fucking cool, they aren't like... Uh, it's hard to like explain, but they're not like 100% a positive force. And what I mean what I mean is like, in terms of this guy, you're part of the Bracers, so you kind of get to see the good of the Bracers, how they're like really nice, they're a cool force. But for example, in Trails uh, from Zero, when you're when you're part of the cops force for the first like half of the game the bracer guild is kind of like an antagonistic organization of the game and so you really get to see how some bracers are kind of like assholes how they're not really nice and throughout the games you guys become homies and you guys get close but you do kind of get to see the other side where like the brace there are bracers that like who disrespect you who aren't really the nicest and even in um trails through daybreak there's like one bracer he just had like one line where like even he was kind of an asshole so it really goes to show you that bracers they are supposed to help the people but not they're not like a magically positive guild that's always doing like the good thing they are obviously trying to do the good thing but like there are some bad eggs in there so that's why it's at number three at number two, I have the SSS. Honestly, this might be number one for me. I like love SSS so much because it is just a very small group. It is a very small section of the police force in Crossbell. And it is literally, you know, just Lloyd, Ellie, Tio, Randy, and later Noel and Wazi. And it's just such a nice, and Kia too, obviously. And it's just like a nice, like, positive group. Like, it's, it's, it's like, I love, I love like how... They, they, they pretty much, they're, they're the cops, but they go out in town and help people with whatever little shit that they need to do. They, I, it's just really 
awesome seeing how they started with literally the entire town fucking hating them no one liked the cops at the start and then you get into reverie by the end of it where like lloyd is giving a speech of liberating crossbell like it's really fucking cool seeing their story from zero to azure i guess but uh it was, it was very cool to see and i just really love every single character in the sss and it was just really cool to see and again i love the bracer guild but like i feel like the bracer guild is big enough where like you don't really know that much like the, everyone in it you know a lot of people in it but it's still a group that isn't the nicest you can say compared to the sss and then the number one i have the thor's military school and pretty much in terms of cold steel you're part of this military school called thor's and yeah, that's, they're just at number one because I feel like it's like the SSS where I feel like they're all like trying to do the positive thing, but it's more interesting where the, you're a school and you you do have some bad eggs. There are some students who are kind of more assholey at the start, but then they become good. But for for some reason, I'm not sure why the Thor the Thor's campus for some reason it just is more of an interesting concept to me. Where when you think of like the SSS. You kind of see how the game would go. It's like, you're the cops. You're going to go out. You're going to help people out because you're the cops. And then when you get a case, you get a case because you're the cops. Like, it just makes sense. Like, it's very linear in terms of, like, how they chose to connect the the cops in terms of the gameplay and storytelling. Where with the Thor's military campus, it's more interesting where, like, you're at the school, but in terms of, like, why you're helping people out is because Reen is part of the... Or, like, at least he's helping out the student council, and that's why you actually go out into town and you help people. And in terms of why you're doing, like, the story quests is because you guys are pretty much going on these field trips to do these exercises in different towns. And so the entire concept to me is just more interesting, and I really like the group of Thor's because just Class 7 alone is just such a cool group, and then and you have the new class seven in the later trolls games and just like all the other characters like lind rex becky like there's so there's so many characters in the campus that you get to know which is really fucking cool and so thor's i feel like it's just a better built out group compared to the other ones even though i really love the sss and i feel like it could go number one depending on when you ask me i think thor's in general is just like a better group because of how big it is and how 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 varied it is compared to the other two and so yeah number three is brazier grilled number two is the sss and number one is the thor's military campus and from here we'll move on to the outro so thank you guys for watching slash listening to episode 32 of spill the material if you are listening on an audio service remember to give it to five stars or thumbs up if you're watching on youtube remember to give it a thumbs up and comment down below if you appreciate it and if you're new feel free to subscribe i really appreciate it i upload my videos to two different channels i have the occasion limited channel which is pretty much for me uploading anything i want and i have the spill the tiro channel which is not only only for spill the tiro episodes but also segment the episodes and upload those every day in case you're only interested in one of the segments of my podcast but yeah thank you guys for watching slash listening to episode 32 and hope to see you next week for episode 33 peace